We have the research team from Ikadvik Sikakun. We're primarily going to be listening to a presentation by Andy Mahoney. Thanks for, for coming along and, and coming here to learn more about it. And for us, the, the learning process has been continuous since we first set foot here in Kotzebue, and, and this is just, for us, another part of that process. Um, this is a, an overview of what um, I and some of the rest of the team will be talking about over the course of the next 45 minutes or so. Uh, we'll start out by asking the question, what is sea ice? Um, now, that might sound like a a silly question to ask up here, because mo most people have a pretty good idea of what it is, but it's an interesting question to ask anyway, and I'll, I'll, I'll ask it a few different ways. And then we'll have a little bit of background about what our project is, Ikagvik Sukukun, what that means, where the name came from, explain what makes the way we're doing our research a little bit different from what most of the research projects I've been involved in before have been like, and, and I think it's different from what most other researchers think of when they, they uh, do their studies. And then um, I'll give a quick summary on our results from this year, which turned out, for, for those of you from Kotzebue, of course, you already know, this is a pretty unprecedented year uh, for sea ice conditions in, in this part of the Arctic. <clears throat> so what is sea ice? Now, <laughs> I feel a bit embarrassed asking that question here, but if you ask me, I'm a glaciologist, a, a sea ice scientist, I'll give you what I think is the very precise definition that it's frozen seawater. That makes it different from lake ice, which is frozen fresh water, and it makes it different from a glacier, which arguably is never frozen at all because it, it already falls as snow that's already frozen, and it's then squashed to become ice. So sea ice is frozen seawater. And the salt that's in seawater makes it really different from those other types of ice that I mentioned. Most of the salt actually kind of gets squeezed out of the ice during the freezing process, but something like 15% is trapped inside brine pockets within the ice. And there's some close-up pictures <coughs> of what those brine pockets look like. You know, some of them you can actually see with the naked eye, but many of them you have to get out a microscope to look at. And those little brine pockets, they're not very big, but they really change the way that sea ice behaves compared to other types of ice. So this is uh, my friend Alex from New Zealand holding up a piece of ice. And you can see that it's, it's kind of opaque. You can't see his mitten through the ice. But if you hold up a piece of lake ice, you can actually see your fingers, you can see your glove through the ice. The ice is clear. So sea ice doesn't let light pass through it the same way that lake ice does. So, so we know that it looks different but it also behaves differently as well. It, it's weaker. If you want to drive your snow machine or your truck on sea ice, you have to let it grow a bit thicker than you do for lake ice. Um, and the little brine pockets also make a big difference if you're a small uh, microorganism or an algae looking for a place to live. You can find a place to live inside sea ice, but lake ice is, isn't a good habitat for those. Um, for those critters. So that's my definition of sea ice as a, a glaciologist, someone who spends most of his day thinking about sea ice. But you can ask other people and you'll get a different answer. And that kind of, that's always the case. Whatever the question is, you get a different answer depending who you ask. So to a climatologist who thinks much, much bigger picture, thinking about the whole world here, they might think of sea ice as something that helps keep the Earth's climate stable. It acts as like the radiator and the water pump of the Earth's cooling system. The poles stay cool because of the sea ice reflecting heat from the sun. And then it helps drive the circulation in the ocean, kind of like a pump that helps bring warm water up from the equator to the pole where it can cool down and, and help maintain a stable temperature. If you ask an ecologist, someone who spends their time thinking about the, the living part of our planet, they're going to tell you that it's, it's a habitat for uh, organisms at the bottom of the food chain all the way up to the top. So it's uh, sea ice algae growing on the bottom side of ice. Um, uh, actually, I'm not sure where that photo was taken, somewhere up uh, in the Canadian Arctic, I think. <clears throat> what type of seal is this? Does anyone recognize this type of seal? It's not one that you find around here. That's actually 
carp seal. It's a Weddell seal from Antarctica. And these guys are, are really big. I, um, I gave a talk to the, the, the sixth graders today, and I explained that the, the hole that that seal is coming up through is about this big, and it's filling, its head fills the whole, the whole hole. And they can weigh almost a ton. So they're, uh, and, and they're top of the food chain in Antarctica. If you asked a walrus, and you could then understand what that walrus said back to you, um, a walrus might think about sea ice as a, a mobile feeding platform. It's, uh, again, I was talking to the, the student, the sixth graders today, and it's kind of like having a couch that takes you to the kitchen and back without you having to get off to go get snacks. They can dive down off of the ice floe to the seafloor, feed from the seafloor, go back to the ice floe to rest, uh, to attend to their young that have to be born on the sea ice. And then by the time they get hungry again, it's a fresh piece of seafloor that hasn't been foraged for them to eat off of. The alternative, hauling out on the land, um, isn't as good for them because they deplete the food on the, on the seafloor near the land and they have to keep going further and further. And that takes a lot of energy, a lot of effort. Um, so they much prefer to get on a piece of drifting sea ice if they can. Now to a sailor, sea ice is something you want to avoid. They think of it as, as a, a source of cost, a source of delay and, and, and potentially a hazard that might damage their ship or, or potentially sink it. Um, so again, a very different view of sea ice um, than I have. And certainly I think a different view of sea ice than the Inuit who live and grow up with sea ice their whole life. So, so these are actually descriptions of sea ice that I heard elders in communities throughout the Arctic tell me. Communities like Upiagvik in Barrow, uh, Kangatukpak in, in, in uh, Baffin Island in, in Canada, and Karnak in Northwest Greenland. Um, and it's a very different way to describe sea ice when, when it's your home. And so again, for the, the sixth graders, this morning, I explained that you can listen to somebody like me tell you about sea ice, and I will tell you about it from my scientific point of view. But I've learned a tremendous amount about sea ice from the elders in the communities. And of course, I encourage them, and I encourage everyone to talk to their elders uh, to learn about the sea ice, and, and to learn about the whole environment around them. Because of course, you can't talk about sea ice without talking about all those other things I mentioned, about the, the walrus, about the, the seals, and the algae. So. <clears throat> Many different ways of knowing about sea ice, many different ways of answering that question, what is sea ice? And sometimes the best answer is the one that you get when you've listened to a lot of people and put all their answers together. And that's part of what we're trying to do in this project, the Ikagvik Sukukun project. Um, the word, I believe, translates to ice bridge. The idea is we're trying to bridge the knowledge of our team of scientists from universities around the country with the knowledge held by the elders here in, in Kotzebue. And with that bridge, get a better understanding of how sea ice fits into the changing environment of Kotzebue Sound and, and the surrounding Arctic. Um, you can see our, our team of indigenous uh, knowledge holders, our advisory council at the top there. I'm very pleased that <clears throat> Ross Schaefer is here uh, sitting in the front row, but we're also very grateful to Cyrus Harris and John Goodwin and, and Ross's brother, Bobby Schaefer. Um, and I just noticed, I'm afraid I, I missed off an F of Schaefer. I'm sorry about that, I just noticed. Um, I probably don't have to spend long uh, on this map showing the area around, but one of the reasons we're interested in Kotzebue is that it's, it's in this enclosed region of Kotzebue Sound that's it's actually different to what's going on outside. So the changes we see here in Kotzebue are actually not well understood if we, want, if we looked outside. The Chukchi Sea and Beaufort Sea have been studied with a lot of other projects, but nobody's really come to Kotzebue Sound. And one of the really interesting things uh, scientifically is that we've got these big rivers coming down into Kotzebue Sound. So we can look at how the sea ice is changing and maybe how that's changed by things going on on the land as well. We've got these connections.
how are we going to look at the sea ice and understand these changes? Well, we've got a lot of tools that we're going to play with. One of them, um, a major part of our project, is flying these unmanned aerial systems. Uh, folks who are here in the spring might remember uh, the open house out at the hangar, uh, the opportunity to see some of these drones. They're a pretty cool aircraft. They're what's called a hybrid quadrotor. They've got um, quad rotors that allow them to take off vertically and then uh, a normal propeller powered by a gasoline engine that allows them to fly more like a fixed wing aircraft. And we can put lots of different instruments in them, essentially kind of bolt, unbolt one and bolt back on another to do different sorts of uh, science with them. And then this should be Launch. a movie. Launch now. Spin up. So vertical takeoff. When it gets high enough, it transitions to its gasoline-powered motor 60, 70, transition. and takes off and then comes back. And it's kind of the reverse. Its main motor switches off. The, the vertical rotors turn on. And it can land without a runway. So for remote Arctic communities, now of course, we have a pretty good runway here in Kotzebue. But you could take this aircraft to other communities and other places that don't have those resources and do the same kind of science that we're doing now. So we're not just doing aircraft measurements. We're also making sure that we get out on the ice um, to, to look at what the ice is like underneath the drones. <clears throat> and then we've also placed uh, an oceanographic mooring out here near a ceiling point to look at what's happening underneath the ice and throughout the whole year. And uh, on the top there is our mass balance site. You, might, you guys might have seen this out in the sea ice during winter. This is a, um, it's really just a simple set of stakes frozen into the sea ice, but that allows us to watch how the snow and the ice change without disturbing them afterwards. So we get this continuous measurement of change without affecting the, the, what we're trying to measure. And on the bottom there, and, and you can see Kate, um, uh, a PhD student from, from University of Alaska Fairbanks, who designed and built these mass balance sites. And we've got Bobby Schaefer and Alex Whiting taking the measurements there. On the bottom, uh, there's this bottom mounted mooring. This is what's been sitting out underneath the ice um, near ceiling point for a year. And this is what the nice clean diagram of it looks like. And then this is what it looks like when you pull it up after it's been sitting on the seafloor for a year. Lots of uh, crustaceans. And you, it's a little hard to see in this, but those are the basket stars that came up, right? Yeah. <clears throat> One of the interesting Whoops. things that I, that I observed when I was on the blue book. Okay. Well, you guys get to listen to Ross now. <laughs> we did some That's interviews so quickly, but... with uh, people from uh, um, Elam. Koyuk and Shaktuli. And in the interview, the interviewer was confused. The people there were talking about Galugas, and all of a sudden they're talking about beavers. They said, wait a minute, wait a minute, you guys are talking about beavers. What, what are they got to do with the Galugas? He said, the Eskimo told me that what's happening with the beavers, once they get populated, they dam all the lakes. So the whitefish have to move someplace else. And so they displace that food source, so the balloons move somewhere else. And that was their connection. And now when you look at Kotzebue and Buckland Bay, the dairy, all our areas are contaminated. There's no safe water because the beavers are everywhere. So that's Ross. Uh, you, you heard it from him. He's sitting in, in the front row here. If you've got any more questions about that, I think I must have skipped a slide there by accident, but the point I was hoping to make is that everything I showed you up to that point is probably like other research projects that you've seen. We come here, we tell you what our study area is, we show you our fancy toys that we're going to play with. But what really, I think, makes our project different from what I've worked on before and, and other projects that I know of is that we've got a really strong connection with the local community and the local knowledge holders. Let me see if I can go back to the slide that I'd... Okay, this is the slide that I'd meant to come up. Um, 
We have an advisory council here in the community made up of, of, of elders who are not just knowledge holders telling us what they know, they're actually allowing us to gain new knowledge by telling us the questions that we should be asking. And so what Ross just told us about the connection between belugas and beavers is when I, when I heard Ross tell me that, it stuck in my mind. That was like three years ago now. And I keep coming back to it. You, it would take you a long time to come up with the idea of even putting a beluga biologist and a beaver biologist together to, to, to look for ideas. But I'm not sure how long it would take for them to even come up with that connection unless they talk to somebody like Ross first. So, so Ross, I don't know if you'd like to add anything to that, but this is the, the, the wonderful value we get from working with knowledge holders in the community. One thing that um, also displaces belugas is the fact that belugas tend to get caught in the ice. Six, seven years ago, we got a whole bunch of belugas. They were probably some of the skinniest belugas we've ever seen in the spring. And uh, some guys even told me that the ones that they caught, one, one beluga they got in the net was so skinny it was like a fish. It was just, there was just nothing there. Uh, what happens uh, in 1984-85, that winter, about, our, our population of belugas was about 6,000 belugas. They got caught over across from Nome, called a place, a place called Sereniki Strait. And um, the village that we went to there, um, I'm trying to remember the name, but I can't. Uh, I was there in 2002, I think it was. And when we got close to the village, we saw stilts. What the heck are those stilts? Didn't figure it out until we got close, and I finally realized that those are the white, uh, the red fox, the fox dens that already have them on stilts to keep them from going down, and so that uh, they, these are the pens where they raise their foxes. And during the time that uh, the belugas got caught, uh, the local folks killed a thousand belugas for fox food and their own food. And probably three or four thousand belugas perished in that um, entrapment. And so um, <coughs> the Russian fleet set over a icebreaker and it broke the ice right up to the belugas that were caught. And then it turned around, but the belugas weren't coming out. So. They played uh, different kinds of music <laughs> until they played uh, classical music. Then the belugas finally followed the boat out. <laughs> so I don't know why, but I guess maybe that you know when you hear belugas underwater, you put your paddle to your ear. It's like a bunch of canaries talking, you know, and uh, it's really evident um, when there's a lot of belugas around, and uh, that's probably why they kind of went along with the um, boat because the classical music probably sound a lot more like belugas than anything else. And so to make a, sh a story short, uh, seven years ago when we got the big bunch of belugas, my son and I got six of them. And um, I knew right away that these belugas had been caught in the ice that winter. And they, they survived. but. You know, uh, when people start starving, and probably the animals same way, once they get to a certain level of starvation, that their bone marrow and everything else is diminished, and a lot of them don't survive after that. And we haven't seen very many belugas since that time. We see a few here and there. So our, unfortunately, our belugas um, didn't learn too much from their lesson of entrapment a long time ago, and they got caught again. And so that, that's one part that really um, <coughs> affects what we have in terms of population. Uh, and so when you look at uh, what the Eskimos were talking about in Norton Sound, that's uh, something that happens in our lifetimes, you know. And, and Norton Sound had been affected by the beavers long before we were. 
and uh, the beavers were only a recent migration into our country, and it's, it's in our lifetime that we, we saw that happen. And they displaced the whitefish like you would not believe. It, it affects the whitefish something terrible. And it's still going on today. So it makes a huge difference on nature. Sometimes we don't see exactly what's happening until you start asking your the old Eskimos are asking the question, okay, what, what's going on, you know? And then they start to realize, oh, the whitefish ain't here anywhere. They moved over this side. And, and that's what our whitefish do. They come out of these big um, uh, places like Anihak. And when the river, the creek blows out, all the whitefish migrate out. And so, um, so that's the blueless food source at that period in time. Happens all the time. It's going to continue to happen. Thanks. Thanks very much, Ross. I think that you know, I think demonstrate some of the, the the immediate value we get from asking people who have lived here and have seen the connections before we come up with our research questions. And that again is one of the things that distinguishes our project from others. Is we were given an opportunity by the Moore Foundation to start our project with a blank slate b before we'd actually come up with our research questions. Um, and this is a, a movie that Sarah put together of our first trip to Kotzebue. Um, as a team, uh, when, when we got to, to meet with our advisory council and, and start coming up with what it was we were actually going to be asking uh, as part of our project. And so you can see, we, we literally start with a, a blank whiteboard. Um, maps are a really good place to, to begin the discussion. And you can see we immediately start focusing on where the important areas are. And pretty soon, we start to fill up a whiteboard with questions, questions that we can start asking with the tools that we've got. What would you like to, wh where would you fly a drone? What would you want to look at? if we bring these drones to Kotzebue um, to fly out over the, the sea ice. So John Goodwin and, and Alex, <coughs> uh, Pearl as well. Pearl uh, made great contributions to, to, to the discussions, things that she remembered from her childhood. And to many people, this is not what their vision of science is. You know, I, I think a lot of people think that it all happens with, with white lab coats on or something. But this is, this is science in the raw. This is new knowledge happening. And kind of look, everyone's smiling and happy. It's fun. This is a really good way to do science. Um, and, and, and I like to think it was a very two-way conversation. You can see Donna showing pictures on her, uh, pictures of fish. What, what were they, Donna? Arctic cod, there you go. See, I'm not a biologist. I don't know these things. But, um, but that's why we have Donna on the team. Um, and I think that this is not only changing the idea with the, the people who fund science, that you can actually get stuff done this way. You don't have to have your research questions crystallized before you get the money. I think this also changes the idea for communities and, and children. We had an open house where we invited uh, the community in to, to see what it was we were doing. Science can look like this. Science can look like a conversation, a, a, a group of friends getting together to talk about things. Um, and you can see we, we made time for, for story time with Vernetta. And that's another really important aspect. Once you've done your science and come up with your findings, how are you going to tell people about it? So telling stories is the way that we share our knowledge. And so we have a storyteller on our team as well. Uh, Sarah, who put together this film, is helping us tell our story, not just in the way that scientists usually tell stories, which is we write these papers that, frankly, only we read ourselves. We're going to make a film that tells our results. That's a much more shareable way of spreading our knowledge. And I think in a way that's a lot more in common with how elders like Ross have been passing on their knowledge for generations. So we're really excited to be doing this project that's a bit different than others that have gone before us. This is what some of the results of that looked like. This is that whiteboard that got filled up with questions. After, I think, 
three different meetings over the span of three days, we identified six questions. And each of these questions we got compacted down to this, these short phrases, but each one of those has lots of other questions underneath it. And I'll just take a couple to explain how, how complex some of them are. You can ask a simple question, but the answers you're going to get are going to be interconnected and, and related to many different aspects that you didn't always think about. So one of the questions, and this is of course very important for subsistence hunters, what environmental factors control marine mammal use of Kotzebue Sound? What has to happen in springtime in Kotzebue Sound to allow the bearded seals and the belugas and, and the ring seals that are, I guess, already here, to allow them to, to come into the sound where they can be hunted? So in order to answer that question, well, we had kind of have to know what, what sort of ice beluga seals and, and uh, bearded seals and ring seals, what sort of ice they use. It, it, we kind of know that they need a bit of ice and a bit of open water, but how much of each do they need? Does, does it matter what shape it is? Does it matter how thick the ice is? Do they need open water for a certain amount of time? Can they, can, can they uh, survive if the ice closes up for a few days, but then opens up again after that? Th these are questions that we don't know the answer to. And in, in coming up with the answers to these, we're going to need to understand how wind breaks up the ice, how currents move it around, how sunlight is absorbed in the water in between the uh, cracks in the ice to allow algae to grow that the fish, that the missing out a few steps of the food chain, that the fish can eat that then the, uh, the, the, the seals will eat. In order to be able to answer those questions in blue, we're going to have to understand our, improve our understanding about the whole system. The next question, what environmental factors control the length of the bearded seal hunting season in Kotzebue Sound? So this involves understanding a lot about hunting, how are seals hunted? We need to know what allows the seals to come into the sound, which is part of the, the, the previous question. But what has to happen to the ice so that you can actually get to those seals? So that the landfast ice, the channel in the landfast ice has to open up. What makes that happen? Now we started talking about snow melt in the mountains. So we're bringing in a much bigger system that all may ultimately affect the bearded seals that are hunted by people here in the community. <coughs> so I won't go into all the six questions in as much detail, but you can see each of those questions, it can be written in a short form, but there's a lot to understand in order to be able to, to start saying anything about it. We came here in April of 2018, and we, we went out on the ice. We flew a lot of drones. Um, and I'm going to talk to you about that. But I think first, we're at the top of uh, Cape Blossom. This is another movie and, uh, by uh, this is the highest Sarah point. that gives a good insight into what we got up to. Today, but in, in my lifetime, the highest point was more than that, probably a couple hundred yards out here maybe because yeah. that lighthouse was put on by the Coast Guard from years ago was on top on top the highest point and all the highest point <coughs> the highest point was critical to us out here because when we go out in the ocean at, at that time back in the 50s and 60s and 70s we had no other landmark other than Cape Blossom because you'd see it out there from 30 to 40 miles and uh, but all the highest points of Cape Blossom are gone in, in my lifetime. The last 50 years, it's massive erosion. Um, all that is gone. The lighthouse fell into the ocean probably 25, 30 years ago. And when we used to commercial fish out here, you used to see it all the time when it fell down. Pretty much every time we try to acknowledge our uh, tradition knowledge, tradition knowledge, what they claim is invalid, basically because uh, there's no documentation of what we know. So that's where a lot of our uh, ideas and what we know, and we tell them that they couldn't accept that. But as years went by, like this project, uh, I can see it's going to be real beneficial, basically, to, uh, to the future, in the future, 
because we're validating what our our people knew. And, this, uh, this past several years, we couldn't go out there because we didn't had we didn't had stable landfast ice uh, soon enough throughout the winter. The ice that we're standing on just kind of formed here. I believe this one formed in uh, this January, this past January, what we're sitting on. It should have been frozen in October uh, on a normal given year. Uh, so this is another pair of ice cores collected from here at the, the, the channel mass balance site where we're measuring ice growth in the, the, the outlet of the, the river channel from the Noatak, Kobuk and Selawik rivers. And this core, as we can see, it's, uh, it's broken up into lots of small pieces and that happens when the ice is made up of more fresh water, which is, which is what we'd expect for sea ice that's influenced by uh, being so close to a river. So what Bobby's doing at the moment um, is putting a current through this wire and the wire goes down under the ice and then back up. So he basically makes a circuit and he's pulling it up until a bar on the bottom hits the bottom of the ice and then he can tell that it's that's the ice thickness and then he reads it from this marker here. And so basically as far as he can pull it up and then he reads it off the marker it'll tell you how thick that ice is. There's a nice way of doing it that you can measure it over time but you don't have to keep drilling holes in different places or drill holes in the same place in which case you would be changing the behavior of the ice in that point. So it's a really nice way of being unobtrusive. So the station is measuring incoming solar radiation, two-dimensional wind speed, temperature, humidity, pressure, and then rainfall, and then it's also got a GPS location on it. This is a pretty cool rainfall sensor because it's, it's actually optical. Um, we've never used an optical sensor before, but it hopefully will be very accurate. Be interested to see. I'm just going to go ahead and open the station up and get the data card out of it. Now, I'm, there are little bits of blood and some um, sort of mucousy material and skin and maybe a little bit of hair. And so I'm just collecting that so that it can go back to the lab where we might be able to find some information about the DNA. So uh, we could extract DNA from blood and from hair and from skin. Um, and so that could go to a sort of a broader effort that's um, looking at the population genetics and understanding who these seals are relative to the rest of the seals in the neighboring Chukchi Sea, Bering Sea, that region as well. I also collected um, some just relatively fresh snow that is from the area where the seal would haul out or be on the on the ice um, with for to test a, a new um, methodology which is called eDNA so perhaps you know we could opportunistically work with people like hunters who maybe come across a breathing hole and if they just sample the snow around that breathing hole there might be some DNA from the seals that sort of slough off, slough off while they're um, coming in and out of their hole. Um, and so we can sort of test whether that would be another approach to get the DNA from the seals as well. So ring seals have really robust claws. And um, often in the walls of a hole, this one's already been enlarged by some melting. And you can see some kind of vertical um, structures on the on the side of the ice, but in one that hasn't uh, been altered by melting, you can see where they've, you can see these raking claw marks on the side kind of spiral. And I don't know exactly how they do it, but I think they kind of get in there and, and spin um, as a way to keep that the hole open when there's still freezing conditions, you know, when if they did, weren't doing that, it would just close up. And so when the drone flies out over this cold ice, the thermal camera will show hot spots of anything that was warmer than that ice, and that is usually heat coming off of the body of marine mammals, such as a seal. So we'll be looking at those thermal images and those hot spots to figure out where seals were hanging out on the ice, and then we'll look at the matching visible image to confirm that it was a seal and to tell what kind. And using that information, we want to figure out what different areas, ring seals and bearded seals, Nashik and Ugruk, 
are using in Kotzebue Sound and what time of year they're doing that. And we're also pairing that with some on-ice work, finding ring seal breathing holes, haul-out holes, and layers, and measuring habitat characteristics around those so that we can figure out more about what needs they have for denning and what time of year those are most important for them. We're here on the coast at the south edge of Kotzebue by the airport waiting for the drone to take off a short distance away from us. As soon as it's in the air, then we're going to go ahead and follow it as the line of sight observers south along the coast down about 10 miles to Cape Blossom where we're hoping to map the edge of the ice where the landfast ice ends and the ocean begins. So today we flew our unmanned aerial vehicle, or UAV, down the coast to Cape Blossom, past Sadie Creek, to the ice edge at the open ocean. And we were flying along the coast to look at the, um, what we think is the ring seal habitat. Um, we were flying two cameras today, a, a thermal camera that measures the temperature of the ice or the ocean and the seals. Or, and, and a visible camera so we, have a, uh, so we can see what we're actually looking at in the thermal camera. Um, the thermal camera tells us about the stability of the ice and may tell us some um, indications of why there's such an early breakup of our receding ice edge this year in Kotzebue Sound. And we're also looking at the, at the ocean edge to see how much warming there is in the ocean, which also may impact the um, breakup and receding of the ocean or of the sea ice in Kotzebue Sound. This is the what we call the Met Flux payload. It's called that because of the measurement that it's making. It stands for meteorological flux. And flux just is a fancy word for change. So it's measuring change effectively in how energy is being transferred um, between the surface and the atmosphere. So it could be over land, called land flux, or it could be over uh, the ocean, called ocean flux or water flux. So you get this flux or energy change measurement by T uh, recording humidity, temperature, and uh, wind. And it's not traditional wind, not just like blowing in a single direction. It's actually, we have to know what the air current is really doing in all three dimensions. So forward, up, and side. So it's a 3D air current measurement. So the 3D air current measurement plus the humidity measurement plus the temperature measurement you can apply some math to, to get the energy flux. Well, we've been here for about three weeks. We've been flying pretty consistently for two. We have been able to get out to the edge of Arcoa, which is 10 miles, um, a few different times now, probably three or four different times, both south and northwest. So what you see here is this is essentially the hangar we're operating from and uh, it's right off of runway 1836 right here that runs north-south and this is the main runway for the airport 927 so we're not far at all from the main runway um, and that's why we have to consider traffic so much um, but uh, essentially we've been able to go all the way down to the tip of cape blossom which is down here, it's almost exactly 10 miles, as well as out to Shashalik, which is almost exactly 10 miles. For today's flight, we started, there's two kind of boxes of mapping, and we started at the northernmost um, plan, ran through that at 500 feet, and then went to the southern plan, ran through that at 500 feet, and then we, um, climbed to a thousand foot and did the did the same two plans again. Um, and now that we're done with that, we're gonna come home and, and uh, get the airplane back and set up for the next flight.
100 feet. Touchdown road. Over the point. A month of work in about 10 minutes um, and, and what I'm going to try and do now is go through real quick um, and talk about what we found as a result of those 10 months in the context that it turned out to be a completely unprecedented year in Kotzebue Sound. So here we have 19 years worth of satellite data from April 19th, so just before we started our project. And April 19th turns out to have been a mostly clear day um, for the last 19 years, which means that on the same day of year, we can look at what the ice was doing. And I realize that it, these are all a bit small and it's difficult to make out the coastline. But I think everyone should be able to see that this year, 2018, just stands out like a sore thumb. Um, and, and Ross, just a couple of days ago, you told us that you'd never seen ice conditions like this before. So, so unprecedented in the satellite record, this particular satellite going back to 2000, but also nothing like Ross has, has seen in, in his lifetime. So quite a, an unusual year. And so in that context, a new question emerged, which is, why did this happen? How did we have cold temperatures air temperatures well below freezing and not have so much ice in Kotzebue Sound. So this is a, a map showing where the drone flew. So the blue lines is everywhere that we flew with the drone. The yellow line is everywhere that we went with the snow machine. Um, and then red dots are where we drilled holes in the ice, took ice cores and things like that. This is a uh, a record of how the ice grew and how the snow, uh, the snow, I'm afraid the snow depth isn't, the colors aren't coming out so well. I'll, I'll have to try and point to the snow with, uh, with the pointer. Does this have a pointer? Yeah. Um, so this is how the ice grew here in what we called the channel site. So this was, um, uh, kind of almost straight offshore from like the Nalugvik. And then the North Bay site, so this was uh, going up north around the coastline, uh, just past where the, the road, the, um, the, 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 the road up to Noah Tank, the ice road leaves uh, the shoreline. And <clears throat> if the snow was showing up clearly on this slide, you might just be able to make out a line, a different, a different color shade in here and then there's another different color shade in here. If the snow was coming out, you'd be able to clearly see that there was more snow at the north site than there was at the south site. But there was quite a lot thicker snow. Normally, that goes the other way around. If you have more snow, you get thinner ice. The snow helps insulate the ocean and reduce the amount of heat that goes from the ocean into the atmosphere. The other thing that's really interesting here is in the channel, the ice kind of stopped growing in the middle of February and sort of reached what looks like it might be kind of an equilibrium thickness. So when I see that, I think that we know that there's heat leaving the top of the ice because the air is colder. So we know heat must be going up, which means there must be some heat coming in at the bottom to, to maintain that constant thickness. And there might be heat down here too, but it's not enough to stop the ice growth. So sort of in, al almost immediately we can start to see that there's some things going on here that might start helping us answer the question why didn't the ice freeze over this year and, and, and what's going on in the Arctic as a whole. So we can take our measurements of ice thickness so, so now we've got just uh, ice thickness at the channel site in red and in, the, in blue at the, at the base site and we can run a computer model that allows us to try and 
reproduce what we saw with the observations. In order to have our computer model match the observations like this, we have to put twice as much heat in the bottom of the channel site that we do in the base site. So we know there's quite a lot of heat in that area off, offshore from the Nulugvik. Um, where is that heat coming from? That's a question we're going to have to try and answer later. But one thing we can do just to give ourselves more context is instead of using the air temperature that we recorded this year, we can look at air temperatures that have been recorded historically. So these are average air temperatures recorded at the airport since the 1950s. And you can see that um, if we take the average for the last decade, the 2010s, we're almost through the 2010s now, really stands out. This last decade has been a lot warmer than anything that's happened in the past. <clears throat> and as a result, when we, when we run our computer model, we find out that if we'd started growing ice on January 20, and we'd had the same air temperatures as we'd had in the past, we would have grown quite a bit more ice in the 1950s than we managed to here, if all other things were the same. If we had the same snow on the ice, we had the same amount of heat coming up from underneath. So we know that the, uh, the reason that things are different now is at least in part due to the, the air temperature changes that are taking place up above. But what effect is this having on the ice and the, and the, the creatures, the seals that live in the ice? We, we visited, wait, how many now, Jesse? 16? How many holes were there? One, two, three, four, five. No, higher than I can count right now. Um, holes, uh, seal holes in the ice, breathing holes and, and lair holes and, and places where the, the seals were hauling out. This is one of them. Um, this was a lair that had collapsed, and we put a camera inside this lair. Um, and I haven't put the camera down too many seal layers before, but this one is flooded. Um, the, either the ice has been pushed down or the water has come up, and the bottom of the seal hole is actually all flooded. And there was actually a seal in this one. We didn't realize until we looked at the camera, looked at the footage afterwards, but you can see there's a, a little... Oh, was that the same? That was the same one again. This one, sorry, yeah. Uh, you can see the little seal nose poking out. So again, this is a somewhat surprising observation to find these seal holes. This is not a, a habitable seal hole. A seal is not going to do well if this, if this is its home. We don't know how common this is, but if we're getting thinner sea ice, this is one of the things that our computer models tell us to expect more in the future. If you have thinner ice, it's more likely that the snow is going to be able to, the weight of the snow will push the ice down and cause the hole to flood. So we may be seeing evidence of the sorts of challenges that ring seals are going to face in, in unusual ice years like we saw this year. Uh, we didn't just look for seals uh, in their holes on the ice. Uh, we also flew overhead with the drone. And these dots represent the locations of all the seals that we were able to see using thermal imaging. So we're going we're to look at this, these, this um, or a group of seals in that area. And this is what uh, we see with, it's kind of like a black and white camera. We see a lot of dots on the ice. And the ice is usually white, so anything dark is certainly worth taking a closer look at. But it's even more interesting in the thermal image because you see that um, these are much, much warmer than the ice around them. So that tells us that this, this is a living body on the ice. And we can actually see that the, in the middle, what's dark in the visible camera is actually not so warm. So that's actually a, a seal hole. It's dark but, but cold, whereas the seals are dark and warm. And we can actually count nine ringed seals here clustered around a, a single breathing hole, or if you, a ring of ring seals, if you like.
The drone also lets us look at the temperature of the ice in, in really quite amazing detail. Once again, this is a, a map showing everywhere that the drone flew. And uh, I think we're going to zoom into this area here now. Um, and you can see we sort of, by circling round and round in these really tight patterns, we were able to get really good coverage of the ice near the, the Landfast ice edge there. And over the course of two different days, uh, May 4th and May 8th, we saw quite a substantial uh, warming of the surface, um, probably due to more absorption of sunlight, but also uh, changing air masses and, and water masses. But what's kind of interesting here is these, the temperature of the ice here is, is all quite cold below the freezing point. That's what we expect for ice. But here the ice has warmed up, in some cases possibly above the freezing point. So now we know that there's water sitting on top of the ice. And we can then take uh, yep, um, a closer look of that. This is what we see in the satellite image. It does look darker. It, it's this region in in here, this is bright white ice, but this is like kind of darker ice. And when we fly the drone over that area, we get to look at it in a lot more detail and we can see that there's uh, kind of bare ice, partially flooded ice, and then very heavily flooded ice. Once again, there in a bit more detail. This is ice that it's not really safe to go out on by a snow machine. So this is where the drones really provide us information that there's no other safe way to get. This sort of flooding makes a really big difference to how quickly the ice melts. The darker the ice, the, the more quickly it's going to melt. Um, and, and, and also, if this water is partly related to the water that was in the seal hole, that, that makes linkages between, uh, more linkages between the, the ice and the species that rely on it. So, oh, that's just for scale. That's about 100 meters, and that's 5 to 10 meters. Um, and so lastly, I'm just going to finish up looking at the data from the oceanographic mooring that we took out there. I mentioned that there's this source of heat that we think was keeping the ice from freezing this winter. Um, do we know anything about where that heat came from? Um, well, so there's a, an animation playing there, but what I was going to draw your attention to to start with, this is the temperature that that mooring measured at the seafloor. And in the winter time between December, January, February, March, it's very, very constant. It hardly, it's, it's actually, it's lying right at the, the, the bottom axis of this plot, right at the freezing point. What I was thinking we might have seen, based on what we saw this spring, I might have seen warm pulses of water coming through. And that might have helped explain why there's so much open water out here in the sound. But we didn't. This is, was a normal, cold year at the bottom of the ocean where this mooring was. So this, you know, this is part of how we go through a process of elimination to work out where the source of heat was that was um, melting the ice. If warm water did come into the sound to melt the ice, it didn't pass directly over this mooring at the seafloor. So, OK, we at least answering where the, where the heat didn't come from. The other interesting thing about this, uh, uh, the, the, the time series is, this plot shows the dissolved oxygen that was measured in the, in the water, which is a sign of uh, biological activity. And you can see this is also very constant throughout the winter. But then all of a sudden, and, and this, these two lines correspond to the time period of this uh, animation here, there's a, a jump in the dissolved oxygen which corresponds in time with when the wind blows the ice away from the coast. And so the ice is moved away, you have more mixing in the ocean, um, and we think that triggered some biological activity in, in the ocean. And Chris can jump in if I got that mixed up at all. <clears throat> so we've got this combination of Airborne drones, uh, under ice moorings, we're, we're getting our feet wet and our, can our hands cold playing around on the ice. And we're trying to put that all together with our indigenous knowledge holders. So that's why we came back now. There's no, there's no ice out here right now. The reason we came back in October is to 
talk with Ross and Bobby. Fortunately, Cyrus and, uh, and, and John aren't in town. But we can start to, this is an iterative process. We ask questions, we come up with answers, and, and we then scrutinize those answers to see if they make sense with what the knowledge holders like Ross understand. So right now, we're trying to understand why 2018 was such uh, an unprecedented year. We, we definitely saw thinner ice, and that seems to be part of a trend. That thinner ice may have contributed to what appears to be an unusual flooding of, of seal dens, or at least one, two seal dens we saw flooded, right, uh, Jesse? Yeah. Um, but we're still scratching our head about where this heat came from. What was it that was slowing down the ice growth? But we're going to come back next year with drones again, um, and we can watch what it is that's actually making the ice melt and maybe make more progress understanding these questions. So with that, if anyone else has any questions, uh, either myself or the rest of the team, uh, including Ross, would be happy to take them. Thank you. complicated what's going on out there and I know that the knowledge that like Ross has have been built over a long long time and what's the chance of the project because this is just a two-year project for a three-year project is there much of a chance it could go for longer than that just given how complex it is um <clears throat> we're certainly hoping it's going to go longer than that the Right now, we have plans to bring the drones back just one more year. We will keep coming back to work with our advisory council for another year after that. But one aspect of our project is that we're trying to build some more capacity for research here in the community. So some of the instruments that we've put out at Sosolik to measure weather and precipitation out there, the equipment to measure sea ice thickness throughout the year. Um, that stuff we want to leave in the community so that it can, that knowledge and, and, and the, the equipment can stay here to keep the research going. In terms of how that fits with broader research that I'm doing, I mean, I see this as a, as a, as a commitment that I've made, that the University of Alaska's made, Columbia's made. We have other ways to keep research funding. The research endeavor as a whole is usually funded through small, uh, small increments. But you know, we've, we've made a start here. We've made a commitment here. And we, we certainly want to make sure that we leave a legacy here. Perhaps if I might add to that, I think I don't have to say this, that you know, often what science does is it just you know, it brings up new questions. In this particular case, <coughs> even though it's a two-year project, what we hope is to actually scratch away at some of the fundamental mechanisms. I mean, we were offered up a very unexpected, almost gift, you can say, in that we got a year that was really bizarre. So what that allows us to do is actually scratch away at that and figure out what made this year different, which may lead us to some different understanding of how these processes work. So we won't be able to tell exactly how it is going to work, you know, into the long term or something like that. But by given by being given something that is completely different, you kind of can do a sort of a contrast with the years prior to see if you know if you can get a little insight into the process that made it this way. Well, thanks everyone. Um, I hope that was. Uh informative um, and if anyone has any questions we have a website uh, that gives a bit more background and it's where we anticipate starting to share our findings as we as we produce them as we analyze our data um, certainly throughout this winter uh, once we put the the ice measuring equipment back in the ice we're gonna plan on putting not quite real time but up-to-date measurements of, of how thick the ice is here in town, and, and hopefully people can use that information and, and maybe help us uh, improve it. Yeah, and if anyone wants to contact us or what's the website, we, if you go to the website, um, people can contact us directly from there and email. Um, 
the needs of the team. Um, and also, I don't know if you wanted to announce that we were looking for uh, local help this winter. Yeah, that's right. Um, actually, as part of this project and, and a project that Donna is working on, we're looking to find people who would be carrying uh, would want to carry out observations, the ice observations that we described here, but also Donna has other observations as part of another project that we'd like to pay for. It would be a paid position uh, on a regular basis to, to make regular measurements through, in this case, through the winter, but for Donna, you're, you, you're looking for someone year round, right? Yeah, so a very related project called the Alaska Arctic Observatory in Knowledge Hub, which is run through the University of Alaska Fairbanks, and um, involves community observing from um, all the way from Wales to Kaktovik is really our, our range of focus and um, I have some, some literature and I actually have the job posting for the Coastal Observer and we would love to bring lots of you into our community, our, our network of communities and um, so I've been thinking about ways that actually that could help the Kaktovik's Kukin project as well um, and so so yeah, if you know of somebody who um, has an intimate knowledge of the land and the sea and the, the ice and the wildlife, um, I'd love to talk to them and might be interested in the job that we pay a, a monthly stipend. Um, yeah. All right. Well, thanks again, everyone. Ikaw, Vixikukun, and you pack for ice bridges.